Hi everybody, Ryan Jackson here, hoping you're having a great day. We're still in Article 555 on our 100 days of the 2023 National Logical Code, but we're going to talk about 555.35 in this video, which covers ground fault circuit interrupters and ground fault protection of equipment. And boy, if you do these types of facilities, you need to be really certain that you're complying with 555.35. Not just because you could potentially fail an inspection, but really because these requirements are absolutely essential for electrical safety around these facilities. As we all know, water and electricity don't mix, or, or you could say they mix a little too well, right? Um, when it comes to water and electricity, how do we ensure that people are not going to get themselves killed around these facilities? This section, 555.35. So this is of paramount importance if you're doing installations around these places. So let's look and see what we did in the 2023 National Logical Code. So section 555.35, GFCIs and GFPE. The GFCI and GFPE requirements were clarified and expanded. Now, if you're familiar with these facilities, you'll know that we've been uh, expanding the requirements for GFCIs and GFPE over the last dozen years or so, and it's for good reason. You know, the code making panel that's responsible for this article, now it's code making panel 7, they were really put into a difficult position, and I think they did a really good job because what happened was marinas and boatyards, yeah, it's been in the code for a very long time. We didn't get a lot of code changes uh, around those facilities. Then suddenly we learned about electroshock, electrical shock drowning. And once we learned about that phenomenon, we had to immediately solve the problem. And that's not easy. So they were dealt a difficult hand. Okay, here's a problem. Fix it right now. And by the way, people are dying. Jeez, so they added GFCI and GFPE requirements. I mean, listen, how do we protect people against electric shock? We throw GFCIs at it, right? If we're already using equipment grounding conductors and we're bonding and grounding and things, what we do is we throw GFCI protection at it. Well, it's not that simple when it comes to marinas and boatyards. Uh, what it says now and what it said in the 2020 code, I, I think is definitely good. So let's kind of take a peek and, and see how we incrementally added GFCI and GFE requirements. So 555.35 says for other than floating buildings, which have their own rules, Docking facilities must comply with the following. All right, so here on the left, we've got our ground fault protection of equipment, and you can see our 20 amp circuit breaker here. These guys here, these molded case circuit breaker, small varieties, usually trip at about 30 milliamps, but that's not a product standard issue. Now, the, recept the uh, device right next to it is a GFCI. Those, for a fact, trip at four to six milliamps. The one to the left of it, the equipment protection, most of them trip at 30 milliamps. They're not a product standard. Listen, ground fault protection of equipment can be the really large circuit breakers that we use for 480 volt, 1000 amp services. Those are not set at 30 milliamps. Those are set at 1200 amps, not milliamps, amps. So we don't generally tell people where to set the GFPE because it can be it can be adjusted. But for these small molded case circuit breakers, usually they're 30 milliamps. So we have requirements for ground fault protection of equipment. We have protection for ground fault circuit interrupters. GFCIs trip at four to six milliamps. GFPE trip at whatever value we set them. They're not normally designed to protect humans, they're designed to protect equipment, and hence the name. Let's keep reading. 555.35a, feeder circuits. Feeders for docking facilities must have ground fault protection of equipment set to open at a maximum of 100, amps, 100 milliamps. All right, so here in the picture, We've got our panel board at the marina, and that panel board is serving all of these individual power, these individual slips out here in the distance. So these could all have uh, marina power outlets like the ones here on the right, and we've got a whole host of circuit breakers feeding them. That would mean all of those circuits from the panel to the marina outlets are feeder circuits because they would start at a breaker and they would end at a breaker. So going from breaker to breaker or breaker to fuse, that's a feeder circuit. So that would be an example of a feeder circuit. 
you'd have to have GFPE set at a maximum 100 milliamps. It could be as small as a small circuit like this one here in the picture. It could be uh, an absolutely massive, you know, 1200 amp disconnect. So whatever type of feeder circuit you're pulling, maximum 100 milliamps. It, again, could be a molded case, uh, molded case circuit breaker. Could be a device like this. This is a, a cool product called the shock block. And if you squint your eyes, you've got the dial here that you can adjust with your screwdriver and you can set it to six milliamps, which of course would be class A GFCI, or you can set it anywhere from 10 to 100 milliamps. So that would be ground fault protection of equipment. That's kind of a cool feature because what you're going to find is that you want to have some level of selective coordination, some, some level to where we can isolate where the problem is occurring. So if we plug in our boat and it starts tripping the ground fault protection of equipment, we need to figure out, is it the boat that tripped the GFPE? Or is it potentially the wires feeding the marina power outlet? Because remember, these marina power outlets, like the one shown in the picture, they're usually not fed from overhead wiring. They're fed underneath, so the wires going out to the, to the power outlet are usually in the water. So it's not always just some guy that rewired his boat wrong. So 555.35b1 says receptacles for shore power must have their own GFPE rated not more than 30 milliamps. All right, so where I plug my boat in, not where I plug in my 120 volt convenience stuff, but where I actually plug in my boat, that receptacle is the shore power device, has to have its own ground fault protection rated not more than 30 milliamps. And that's what we're showing here. The circuit breaker on the bottom is providing ground fault protection of equipment for the receptacle on the right. If I plug that in, turn on my boat, right, turn it on, and something trips, Hopefully, if it's the problem of the boat, it trips this device. If it's the problem of the wires feeding the shore power outlet, hopefully it would trip this device that's upstream. And if you're using an adjustable feature like this, remember the code says up to 100 milliamps. So you could set the shore power outlet at 30 milliamps. You could set this device at 50 milliamps. And then you could put the device on the service disconnect maybe at 100 milliamps. So you can do kind of a, a tiered layer system of protection so that you can figure out uh, where the problem is coming from. Other outlets. Outlets that do not supply shore power must have GFCI protection if they're supplied by branch circuits rated 150 volts or less to ground, 60 amps or less, or 100 amps or less if it's three phase. All right, so you've got ground fault protection of equipment for the boat, you have GFCI protection for everything else. So here's my regular old receptacle. We would just follow the typical rules in 210.8b. It's outdoors, it's gotta have GFCI protection. But even if that rule didn't exist, this rule says, listen, outlets that don't supply shore power still have to have GFCI protection. Now, we have to be careful with the word outlet in this section because it doesn't say receptacle outlets, it doesn't say lighting outlets, it just says outlet. Remember that an outlet, as defined in Article 100, is a point on the premises wiring system where current is taken to supply utilization equipment. So it's not just receptacles that require GFCI protection, that would include lighting outlets as well. So if I have luminaires on my dock, on my boatyard facility, I've gotta have GFCI protection for those as well. If I have hardwired equipment, remember hardwired equipment terminates at an outlet where the hardwired equipment meets the premises wiring, that's the outlet. So it's not just GFCI protection for receptacles, it's GFCI protection for just about everything that's on that marine or, or uh, boatyard. There's an exception that says circuits below the low voltage contact limit. Uh, that's defined in Article 100, and it depends on whether or not it's AC or it's DC or it's chopped DC. But generally speaking, we're talking like 10 to 15 volts. Generally speaking, go to Article 100, you can see the definition but circuits that operate below the low voltage contact limit that do not require grounding and are supplied by a power source that complies with 680.23A2 do not require GFCI protection. Let me just say this in plain English. Uh, if you have low voltage lights and they're supplied from a swimming pool transformer, 
that's really what we're saying here. So on the left, you can see that that thing says that it's a low voltage landscape and what? Swimming pool, spa, light transformer. If you're coming out of one of those things, the voltage and the current are low enough and it's an isolated system that you're not going to kill anybody with it. So if you want low voltage lighting, supply it from one of these and it doesn't have to be GFCI protected. 555.35D, leakage current measuring devices. This is kind of an interesting section. I, I support that we're checking the premises for leakage current, but I'm, I'm not sure how enforceable this is. It says, if there are more than three shore power receptacles, a device that measures leakage current must be available and must be used to measure leakage current from each boat. I think the National Electrical Code can require that we have a product there I don't know that we can actually require somebody to use it. That's just not within the scope of the code. Um, I'm not saying that people should not be testing. Listen, we need to be testing. This is a very serious issue. I'm just saying that I don't know that the NEC is the right document to say this. So we need to have something there that can check for leakage current. That can be a piece of equipment. It can also just be a meter like this. This is a uh, this is a fluke device that's designed specifically for measuring leakage current. But if we're being honest, it could just be a regular clamp-on ammeter. We could use that to to measure it as well. Now, new to this version of the code, effective January one of twenty twenty six, the device has to be listed. All right, no problem. The last thing is an exception that says if the shore power equipment provides leakage indication and alarm the device required by d is not required now i haven't seen this personally but I'm, I'm guessing they make it if not i hope they do in the in the near future what if the actual shore power outlet device the marina power equipment what if it had built-in leakage current detection and it would go into alarm if a boat was miswired and was sending leakage current throughout the water Sounds like a cool design. If, if they make it and you install it, well, then you don't need to have the testing device because that's doing it for you. All right, we will see you on the next video where we take a deeper dive into Article 555.